Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our Friday morning virtual journal club. This is Mark Erkin, and I'd like to welcome you to what I think will be an incredibly educational experience here this morning. In keeping with our international um, uh, um, orientation with respect to uh, participation um, in this forum, uh, we are extremely fortunate this morning to have two international experts um, in thyroid cancer care. The first is uh, Dr. Fabian Petoya, who is the head of thyroid section of the Division of Endocrinology at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, he is also the investigation area coordinator um, at his institution. Um, Dr. Petoya really needs no introduction. He is internationally renowned and a member of many societies and is currently the president-elect of the Latin American Thyroid Society. And um, we are also incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Sugatani, who will be our dis discussant this morning. He is the chairman of the Department of Endocrine Surgery at Nippon Medical School. His research is focused on clinical studies of thyroid cancer, active surveillance, risk stratification for differentiated thyroid cancer, as well as clinical trials for anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Dr. Sugatani is internationally renowned um, for his expertise in thyroid cancer management. Um, he is vice chair of the board of directors for the Japan Thyroid Association. Um, I wanna thank both of these gentlemen for participating. It's, um, uh, they are um, uh, on opposite sides of the world here and joining us for um, this session. As every uh, week, um, we do record this, and if uh, you, your trainees or your colleagues are not available to watch on Friday morning, this will become available as a recording on Monday. So I wanna encourage everyone to uh, liberally uh, use the question option to be able to um, write in questions uh, during the course of the presentation over the next 45 minutes, and I will do my best to I get to as many of those questions as possible before we end um, at nine o'clock. So with that, uh, Camilo. Good morning all. Welcome to the Thank Foundation's virtual journal club. I'm gonna present to you this uh, small case. It's a 50, 53 year old woman that underwent a, a thyroidectomy and was pro proven with thyroid cancer in her left thyroid lobe. In pathology, a 2.1 centimeter with classical variant PTC was identified along with six out of 13 lymph nodes that were uh, identified with metastatic PTC. No extrathyroidal extension or lymphovascular invasion were reported. The patient underwent remnant ablation and, uh, with a dose of uh, IDEN-131 followed by TSH suppression therapy, therapy with levothyroxine. On follow-up, the patient uh, presented with a, a TSH of 0.112 a thyroglobulin of 0.41 and undetectable thyroglobulin anti antibodies. No clinically suspicious findings were found on follow-up ultrasound and based on the above characteristics, how would you classify the patient's response to therapy? You will have a couple of seconds to answer to this poll in a second now. So thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Urkan, for inviting me to speak about this paper. We published uh, last year about the dynamic risk assessment in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. And I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. So the topic I am going to address during these uh, 30 minutes is uh, first assessing the initial risk of recurrence, something that we have been hearing for at least one decade. And uh, we know that when we have some pre-surgical data, uh, we can have a, a mere idea of what the risk of recurrence of this patient may be. For example, with the clinical data, the ultrasonography, 
uh, other images, the studies, the cytology, or the molecular uh, profile. So with these data, we can have a kind of idea how our patient is going to do with uh, what treatment we are going to choose and how is he going or she going to do after treatment. When we receive uh, the data of our surgeon and then the data from the pathological report, we will have the immediate surgical risk of recurrence, which is a static risk of recurrence, can, which can be also um, increased data with the those obtained from remnant ablation, if we perform remnant ablation. And finally, we have uh, during the follow-up, what we have been calling the dynamic risk assessment or the ongoing risk assessment proposed by uh, Michael Tuttle from the Memorial of New York. And so we have like a different pieces of a puzzle that can be put together at the end of this situation. And we can finally predict how this patient is going to do in the, the long-term follow-up. In 2012, I have proposed this idea of the broken chair. This idea of the broken chair is very, very frequent in countries like in Latin America. Our country is one of that, in which sometimes we do not have the complete information about the initial risk of recurrence. And perhaps we uh, see a patient and we do not have any information about the surgical procedure or the pathological detailed report and sometimes even we do not have reliable image studies or reliable laboratory tests when we see for the first time in this patient. And sometimes the four legs of this initial risk of recurrence uh, are missing. And I can show you later how it, is, it can be overcome the situation of having missing legs in a patient with a differentiated thyroid cancer with the dynamic risk assessment. When we see there were uh, several societies around the world who created these definitions of the risk of recurrence, and we have been using the American Thyroid Association risk of recurrence since uh, we validated together with other uh, three uh, hospitals around the world, uh, the Memorial of New York in Italy, then uh, Fernanda Weisman in Brazil, and we were one of the fourth who validated for the first time the American Thyroid Association risk of recurrence from the uh, 2009 guidelines, mainly in those patients who received total thyroidectomy and remnant ablation. So this initial risk of recurrence was uh, uh, modified in the 2015 guidelines with the modified risk of recurrence classification and uh, we can see here that uh, you already have been seeing this for several uh, years, that the low risk group of patients was increased mainly because of the introduction into this group of patients with lymph node metastasis, mainly incidental uh, lymph node metastasis. In uh, 2018, we wanted to see what happened uh, with uh, the, what was the impact of this uh, new classification of the pathological report. And what we found in uh, our cohort of patients, it was only 63 patients, but we saw that if we took the slides and reviewed according to the new data proposed by the American Thyroid Association, we had a change of 22% of patients in the initial risk of recurrence. And you can read here, which were the situations by what, why this patient changed from low, intermediate, or intermediate high risk of recurrence, including also patients who were diagnosed with an FTP, a situation that was not previously defined. And when we applied these reclassifications in patients, what we found, if we used the uh, classification of 2015, but considering the uh, historical pathological report, we had this uh, frequency of a structural incomplete response, 2% in low risk and 6% in the intermediate risk of recurrence. And we, we, if we applied 
this, we had 0% in the low risk and 20%. So probably when we do this reclassification and by using all the new data, uh, we are doing like this fine tuning to better understand the risk of recurrence of our blood page. So I'm going to go through four cl uh, clinical cases. Let's go to a uh, first case, a female patient, 23 years old. She received a total thyroidectomy with a papillary thyroid cancer, uh, classic variant, 2.5 centimeters, no clinical, no, no uh, metastasis, no clinical metastasis, and uh, distant metastasis. And so we know by the uh, risk of recurrence and the previous publications that the risk of recurrence of this patient is around five to six percent, the presence of a structural incomplete response. Let's move to a second case, a female patient, 34 years old, she received a total thyroidectomy plus a lymph node dissection due to a clinical lymph node with a papillary thyroid cancer, classic variant, 3.4 3 centimeters in larger diameter with four foci of vascular invasion and 12 from 18 affected lymph nodes. So by this data, and we know that the vascular invasion gives a, a larger uh, risk of recurrence to this patient, together with the clinical lymph nodes and the number of lymph nodes, so we know that this is a, um, an actual intermediate risk of recurrence. A third case, a female of 60, 65 years old with, who received a lobectomy with a papillary thyroid cancer with three foci of a papillary thyroid cancer, multifocal micropapillary thyroid cancer with a risk of recurrence of around 6%, again, a low risk of recurrence. And the last case, a male patient, 55 years old, he received a total thyroidectomy plus a lymph node dissection with a tracheal ring resection with the papillary thyroid cancer variant, five centimeters with four foci of vascular invasion and 15 affected lymph nodes, two of them with extracapsular extension. So we know that this patient has a high risk of recurrence, larger than 40% probably. So how we look the uh, risk of recurrence classification, probably like this, it is not a static and a very, uh, um, uh, classification, and we have like uh, this situation of having patients with low risk, intermediate low, intermediate or actual intermediate, intermediate high, and high risk of recurrence. So after having the initial risk of recurrence, we have to understand which uh, means the um, what means the response to treatment. And this was defined in the, in, for those patients who received total thyroidectomy and remnant ablation, this was defined in the um, guidelines, uh, the American Thyroid Association Guidelines for Thyroid Cancer uh, in 2015. And I'm, go, I'm not going to go through the definitions of the excellent, indeterminate, and biochemical incomplete response or structural incomplete response, only to concentrate mainly in one point, that is, in those patients who did not receive a total thyroidectomy and rem uh, who, did, who did not receive, sorry, uh, remnant ablation, only a total thyroidectomy, that the indeterminate response to treatment means uh, a, a value of thyroglobulin between 0.2 and 5 nanograms per ml, and a biochemical incomplete response when these patients do not have an antithyroglobulin antibodies. At thyroglobulin level larger than five nanograms per ml. And again, the, the excellent response for those patients with lobectomy was defined. This was an arbitrary number uh, put by the group of uh, Momesto and Dr. Taro, uh, but this probably is uh, changing now, this static level of uh, 30 nanograms per ml, and so probably we will talk about this uh, a bit later. So when we have the responses to treatment, we can move from these static risk of recurrence to the dynamic risk assessment, and I have called these the repair chair, so we may have an idea how this patient is going to do. So if we have the first patient, and this patient with a low-risk papillary thyroid cancer at six months has 
a thyroglobulin under levothyroxine therapy, not suppressive, thyroglobulin of 1.9, we know that this patient with, with an ultrasonography with no abnormal findings, this patient has an indeterminate response to treatment. The second case with an intermediate risk of recurrence patient who has a, had a stimulated thyroglobulin due to not correct uh, replacement therapy with levothyroxine of 1.9. And at nine months, we have a thyroglobulin and detectable thyroglobulin with uh, negative antibodies and no ultrasound uh, abnormal findings. We have probably in this case, kind of patient a mixed response because we had previously uh, stimulated thyroglobulin of 1.9, but we could say that probably this patient is having an excellent response to treatment. In the <clears throat> third case, when we have a lobectomy, we know that this uh, thyroglobulin level probably is indication that this patient is doing very well. And if we, uh, what is, which is more important is the uh, absence of uh, abnormal findings in the uh, ultrasonography. And so we have an excellent response to treatment. By the end, for the high-risk patient who received remnant ablation after recombinant human TSH with stimulated thyroglobulin of nine nanograms per ml at the moment of the administration of the rioiodine ablative dose, this patient, uh, this situation is indicating that probably this patient is going to do well if this is a well-differentiated thyroid cancer. And if we have an excellent response to treatment, we will see later what does this mean for a high-risk patient. So what we already know about many, many, many publications around the world that the, is that the risk for a structural incomplete response in the long-term follow-up is really very low one to 5% for low and intermediate risk of recurrence, and maybe a bit higher for those patients with high risk of recurrence, which may be around 15%. So in our paper, this is one of the, the tables of this paper showing some publications, historical publications, showing that if we have an excellent response to treatment, independently of the risk of recurrence, we could have uh, prevalence of a structural incomplete response that goes from 0.5 to around 4% for most of these series, including this prospective trial that I'm going to uh, talk later, that when we consider those patients who have a high risk of recurrence, an initial high risk of recurrence, the structural, the, the, um, structural incomplete response in those patients who had an excellent response to treatment is around 14%, which was already published by the group of Dr. Tuttle in 2010. And perhaps it can be decreased if we have a pre-ablation stimulated thyroglobulin less than one and negative anti thyroglobulin antibodies, which may be decreased this prevalence to 2.9%. So the excellent response to treatment means that most of these patients are going to do really very well in the long-term follow-up, even for those patients who have with high risk of recurrence. This was one of the <clears throat> investigations cited in the bibliography of our publication. It was uh, one of our papers showing that when we had an excellent response to treatment, these were more than 300 patients with a median follow-up of 66 months. We did not have any uh, structural incomplete response, and it was increased when we have an indeterminate response to treatment, a biochemical incomplete response, or of course, when we have an, a structural incomplete response, the probability or the frequency for this patient to have a, a second or third uh, structural incomplete response uh, during the follow-up is really very, very high. So we have also data from the prospective studies, the, the estimable one, uh, which showed the results from five years follow-up of this randomized trial by uh, comparing ablation after using recombinant human TSA, thyroid hormone withdrawal, 30 millicuries or 100 millicuries. And the study showed something very important. In low-risk patients, which were most of these patients were defined as low risk of recurrence, the uh, probability or the frequency of having a uh, structural incomplete response was only 2%. Uh, 
and 98% of these patients had no evidence of this disease at this five years follow-up time. And another important data is that the prevalence of lung metastasis in patients with uh, initial uh, low risk of recurrence is really very low, and it is around 0.5%. This study also gave some interesting findings, which is that those patients who had uh, an ablation of uh, a thyroglobulin less than uh, one has a very, very low probability of having a structural incomplete response, 0.3%. And from those patients who had an initial excellent response to treatment, the prevalence of a structural incomplete response at the end of follow-up was only 0.15%. Uh, so we are, uh, with this prospective data, having another study showing that the excellent response to treatment is a very good predictor to define that this patient is going to do very well in the long-term follow-up. The, the other um, prospective study was the high-low study, showing practically, practically the same. In this, group, um, in this trial, um, there were also patients with intermediate low risk of recurrence included, so the prevalence of uh, structural incomplete response was around nine, uh, 5%, with 95% uh, of patients with no evidence of disease at the end of follow-up, and the prevalence of lung metastasis was 0.9% for this group of low and intermediate uh, risk of recurrence. Uh, and another important uh, issue is that uh, in this trial, the, the structural incomplete response may appear not only in the two or three years after the uh, treatment, but also after five or six years. So the second response to treatment, is, or and the third, when we have a um, an indeterminate response to treatment or biochemical incomplete response to treatment, what we know because of many, many publications, is that the risk for the structural incomplete response in the long-term follow-up is around 20%. And probably in one third of these patients, the no evidence of disease status is obtained only with the mere observation. There, there, there are some new papers showing that probably we can better refine the uh, risk of recurrence if we have uh, some data about the molecular testing. And the uh, American Thyroid Association guidelines have proposed that if we have a combination of BRAF mutation and uh, CHARG mutation, this could increase the risk of recurrence for uh, this patient to around 40%. And here it is shown how those patients who had an excellent response to treatment and had a CHARG mutation uh, had a very high hazard risk uh, for having recurrent structural incomplete response. So probably if we want to understand these patients with a high risk of recurrence who uh, have this uh, situation of uh, a structural incomplete response, which I mentioned before, it is around 15%. Probably if we have this data, we can better predict this situation, which is not um, affected in those patients with the third wild type. What happens with those patients with, uh, who do not receive or did not receive remnant ablation? Well, there are some uh, papers, including ours, that shows that the, the excellent response to treatment for these patients is really very similar to those patients who receive remnant ablation. And what it is completely different is the percentage of a structural incomplete response for those patients who have an indeterminate response to treatment which is lower. And it is clear because we are considering that these patients have, uh, were not ablated, so a thyroglobulin level of, of one or two may probably signify the presence of um, the remnant of the thyroid gland. So the structural incomplete response in this group is lower, and the structural incomplete response in the biochemical incomplete response is a bit larger, which is very interesting is that the, for most of these studies, when a patient non-ablated have a structural incomplete response, he or she may repeat this structural incomplete response in the long-term follow-up. 
And this is uh, seen, this was seen in the uh, Mameso and Tuttle uh, paper showing that those patients who uh, had a biochemical incomplete response in the low risk of recurrence may have a larger probability of a structural incomplete response than those uh, previously observed in patients who received remnant ablation. So these are a low number of patients and probably need to be um, addressed in new investigations. This is a very interesting paper from Park uh, from Korea showing exactly the same. For the low risk and intermediate risk of recurrence, patients who receive total thyroidectomy or lobectomy without a remnant ablation, uh, we observe that the prevalence of a structural incomplete response or the excellent response to treatment is very low, less than 1%, 1.5% for the indeterminate response, 16% for the biochemical incomplete, and as I shown before, 100% for those who had a structural incomplete response. So how do we decide Renman tablation in patients with low and intermediate risk of recurrence in our hospital? This is a paper that we also cited in this uh, publication, and we um, decide the remnant ablation during the first six to one year after total thyroidectomy. When we have a total thyroidectomy and we have a high dynamic risk of recurrence, that is patients who have a thyroglobulin level higher than five under levothyroxine therapy, increasing thyroglobulin levels or increasing thyroglobulin antibodies in the first month, we will move these patients to the remnant ablation group. And this is what happens in the low risk of recurrence almost after seven years of follow-up. Here you can observe that the response at final follow-up was 5% of a structural incomplete response for those who receive remnant ablation with this uh, methodology and only 2% for those patients who did not receive remnant ablation. This is very, very similar for the low risk, which is different is for those patients who we decide to postpone remnant ablation with an intermediate risk of recurrence, and we move with the dynamic risk of recurrence. What happens at the end of follow-up, we will have a smaller prevalence or smaller frequency of a structurally incomplete response in those patients who did not receive remnant ablation, and it is clear because we are using thyroglobulin to define the administration of rhyoiodine, and in those patients who receive remnant ablation, the frequencies of a structural incomplete response, those patients who have an increase in thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin larger than five nanograms per ml was around 22%. To end up my presentation, uh, I want to talk briefly about the impact on follow-up of these findings. When we have an excellent response to treatment, of course, probably we do not need uh, stimulated thyroglobulin, and we only will use uh, thyroglobulin under levothyroxine therapy uh, every one or two years. And we already know because of recent data that there, are, there is a little role for neck ultrasound in these kind of patients. We will keep uh, TSH almost normal. For the indeterminate response to treatment and biochemical incomplete response, the structural incomplete response is different considering if these patients were ablated or not, if they received remnant ablation, the structural incomplete response is what is shown here between 15 and 20 percent for both responses, and it is lower for those patients who did not receive remnant ablation, which is around 5 or 2 percent. And so we will decide the next steps according to the trend mainly of thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies, and we'll try to keep a TSH less than uh, one for these patients. And for those patients with a structural incomplete response, there is no doubt that we need to be very careful and follow up very close these patients, mainly with many studies when it is indicated and uh, suppressed viral, uh, TSH level. To end up uh, my presentation, I end with this uh, clinical case. Should I worry? A female patient of 40 years old, she received a total thyroidectomy in 2018. We do not know the, the surgeon. She had a classic papillary thyroid cancer of 2.5 centimeter with five from seven lymph node metastases. So we do not see very well if this patient have a low risk of recurrence or intermediate risk of recurrence. So we are looking at a picture like this, saying probably it is a dog, but I don't know if it's going to bite me or 
probably is a good dog. I don't really understand what I'm seeing here. If we wait, for example, three months, out at three months, we have a thyroglobulin under levothyroxine therapy of 2.5 nanograms per ml. We know that this patient is having an indeterminate response, and we are understanding that the risk of recurrence may be between, between 1 to uh, 15, 16, 20 percent. We are better understanding how this patient is going to do, and probably I'm trying to see that this is a, a dog, but I don't really see what is going to do this dog with me. And at nine months, if we have an undetectable thyroglobulin with undetectable antibodies, normal neck ultrasound, and we define an excellent response to treatment, I can realize that this is my dog who is called Conchita. So finally, we can have a better view with this uh, weight and take decision uh, idea and not deciding everything from the first moment. I want to thank very much. And the take home messages are that the concept of the broken chair may apply to many countries around the world. The response to treatment helps to repair the, the broken chair, aiding to predict a reduced probability of a structural incomplete response, mainly in low and intermediate risk patients. We usually take the decision for random tablation in low and in most patients with intermediate risk by considering the dynamic risk assessment, and this is to work really very, very well. When we have an excellent response to treatment in low and intermediate risk of recurrence, the ultrasonography should be done only if thyroglobin or thyroglobin antibodies change over time. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sugitani. I'm really honored to be given this opportunity to talk about uh, risk assessment in papillary cell carcinoma, uh, following Professor Pitoya's uh, excellent lecture. Um, and I'm very happy to share Japanese perspective with all of you. I have nothing to disclose. I've been thinking that current keywords in the management of papillary cell carcinoma, PTC, are to prevent overdiagnosis and overtreatment and to accomplish risk adapted management adequately. To put these keywords into practice, conducting risk assessment throughout the whole process of diagnosis, surgery, adjuvant therapies, and follow up for each patient is very important. This is a figure by Professor Mike Tato. He describes the process as a dynamic, iterative, and active process. The risk assessment begins in the peridiagnostic period. In this period, it's important to identify low risk PTCs that may be eligible for active surveillance. And it's also important to identify high risk patients who need classic treatment regimen. Recently, the incidence of PTC has been remarkably increasing. However, the most mortality from thyroid cancer has remained stable. Thus, there is an emerging debate on overdiagnosis and overtreatment of subclinical PTC. As one of the measures to prevent overtreatment of such PTCs since 1990s, uh, clinical trials of active surveillance for very low uh, papillary cell microcarcinoma have been initiated at two Japanese institutions, Kuma Hospital and Kansai Institute Hospital. As a result of active surveillance for nearly uh, 3,000 patients with P1A, M0, M0 papillary cell microcarcinoma, we found that the vast majority of tumors did not grow. 
very few patients developed lymph node metastasis and outcome were not badly affected by dread conversion surgery. Thereafter, a risk stratified decision making framework to select candidates for active surveillance of PPMC was developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. The framework is consisted with three domains tumor characteristics. patient characteristics, and medical team characteristics. Based on these criteria, patients with PPMC are classified into ideal, appropriate, and inappropriate candidates for AES. Very recently, the Japan Association of Endocrine Surgery, JAES, uh, produced consensus statements on indications and strategy for AES of adult roles PPMC. It was just accepted for publication in Thyroid. We'd greatly appreciate it if the Thyroid Journal Club could introduce this paper at some time. Next step of risk assessment would be carried out at the time of decision-making in initial treatment for PTC including surgery and adjuvant therapy. In, it consists of both mortality risk and recurrence risk assessment. The mortality risk assessment was initially developed to interpret the unique biological characteristics of PPC. It has been well known that there are discrepancies between subclinical and clinical PTC. I mean, uh, between incidence of PTC in an autopsy series or ultrasound screening and screening and clinical incidence of PTC. It's also evident between incidence of microscopic regions in the thyroid or lymph nodes and clinical recurrence rate at this site. The, uh, most low risk PTCs remain harmless and asymptomatic throughout the life of the patient. According to the conventional idea, cancers would progress time dependently. However, this idea could not explain the unusual nature of PTC. Basic concept in risk group classification was invented from the idea that low and high risk cancers are biologically different diseases from the beginning. Then, this group classification system was developed to divide low and high risk patients to predict the individual possibility of cause specific mortality based on the static risk factors at the time of initial treatment. AMES and AMESIS system was a classic risk group classification system. AMES is the acronym of age, distant metastasis, exercise extension, and size of the tumor. MESIS uh, means um, uh, distant metastasis, age, completeness of resection, invasion, and tumor size. In 2004, we devised the original risk group classification system for PTC to anticipate cause based survival at Cancer Institute Hospital. All patients with distant metastasis and older patients with massive extracellular extension or large nodal metastasis are defined as high risk, while the other patients are defined as low risk. This system has a wider range of low risk groups than other systems. According to the system, uh, among 1,167 patients with PTC, 81% was defined as low risk, and 19% were classified into high risk. 10-year cause space survival uh, for low risk group was 99%. On the other hand, that for high risk group was 74%. Now, TNM staging system is widely used as a method of mortality risk assessment. It was updated in 2016. These are the major points of modification for eighth edition. Age cutoff was changed from 45 years to 55 years. 
uh, minimal exercise extension to the peripheral soft tissues were removed from T components. New T3B categories for growth ETE only to the stop muscles was introduced. All the patients with exercise extension and were informed of metastasis were downstaged. Accordingly, a substantial number of patients with PTC are moved into lower stage, resulting in much better separation of each group with respect to post survival. Nowadays, initial surgical procedure for DTC or PTC was determined using TNM evaluation. ATA guidelines 2015 recommend total size dextomy for tumor larger than 4 cm, growth CTE, clinical lymphonode metastasis, or distant metastasis, and recommend lobectomy uh, for tumor smaller than 1 cm and no invasion, no metastasis. For patients with 1 to 4 cm intracellular of DTC, either total cytostomy or lobectomy can be selected. This is the JAS guidelines, which was devised in 2018. Also recommend total cytostomy for patients with tumor larger than 4 cm, growth CTE, lymph node metastasis larger than 3 cm, or extranodal invasion, or distant metastasis. They recommend lobectomy for T1 and 0 M0, tumor size less than 2 cm. Either total cytostomy or lobectomy was adopted for intermediate group of patients. Under the concept of risk-adapted management, treatment policies for extent of cytostomy in initial surgery look very similar in both guidelines. However, considering the history of management strategies for patients with PTC, drastic change occurred recently. It was from traditional one-size-fits-all strategy to decent individualized policy. In Western countries, standard procedures for PTC had started from total cytostomy with radioactive iodine. On the contrary, in Japan, most patients had been treated with lobectomy. Thus, in the United States, the majority of patients with small PTC are still treated by total cytostomy. On the contrary, in Japan, total cytostomy uh, was adopted for only 40% of all kinds of DTC. As I mentioned before, our own risk group classification system defines low risk group much broader than the other systems. Even though 82% of patients with low risk cancer were treated by resistant total cytostomy, however, the disease-free survival or post-stress survival not significantly different from those who underwent total cytostomy. At the time of decision-making initial treatment, in addition to mortality risk assessment, recurrence risk assessment should be considered because there is no risk of mortality where there is no risk of recurrence. However, it's important to understand the risk of recurrence does not parallel with the risk of mortality in PTC. Recent studies show that active surveillance was feasible for patients with lymph node metastasis of DTC. Only a few patients and active surveillance required invasive intervention, such as surgery or external radiotherapy in this series. Our previous study showed even with distant metastasis, patients with metastasis only to the lung and less than two centimeters had a 91% five-year cold space survival and an 83% 10 year cold space survival. Thus, to assess the recurrence risk of PTC, we have to keep in mind that a substantial part of PTCs will be harmless to patients. ATA guidelines 2009 
propose the risk of recurrence classification in this way. As Professor Pitoya has already shown, the classification was defined in AT, AT guideline 2015, taking the detailed information of pathological and molecular findings into consideration. As for the molecular markers, for existing BRAF and SAT promoter mutations, are reported to be able to identify PTC with highest recurrence rate. This line. Our team also recently reported the significance of third promoter mutations as a promise marker for disease-free survival and cause-less survival with patient, for patients with PTC. Moreover, we found the patient with one to four centimeter intrathyroidal PTC without such mutation was successfully treated with robectomy. The last part of risk assessment is, is response to therapy assessment during follow up. Assessing so, ass, assessments so far refer to static estimates. However, here we have a dynamic risk stratification system. As Professor Pitoya has already made an excellent review, dynamic risk assessment is a modern and very effective way to evaluate the situation of the patient right now. Initially, the definition was validated only for patients who underwent total cytosexomy and remnant ablation. But recently, definitions for patients without without remnant ablation developed. Plus, even for patients treated with only lobectomy were uh, developed. As a Japanese person, I am interested in the lobectomy part. It's defined by non-stimulated cytoglobin level, cytoglobin antibody level, and findings on imaging studies. Dr. Cho evaluates the DRS, uh, DRS system for patients who underwent lobectomy. Consists of 50%, 55% low risk and 45% intermediate risk according to the APA classification. Structural recurrences was seen in 1.6% for excellent response group, 3.8% for indeterminate response group, and 2.9% for biochemical incomplete response group. The PBE proportion of variance explained by this system was higher than, the, that, of, than that of the ATA risk estimate, but it was lower than that for patients treated with total cytodectomy with radioactive iodine. I'm afraid when we expand the indication of lobectomy to cases with lymph node metastasis, minimal ETA, or benign nodular goiter, the reliability of the system might be insufficient. In my personal opinion, future tasks in this classification for PTC are to establish a proper definition of low risk DTC, appropriate to its uh, favorable prognosis, expanding indication of lobectomy, developing a more precise DRS system after lobectomy, and even provide an indicator to stop follow up. To establish a system judging the timing to move into molecular targeted therapy for high risk DTC. Sophisticated molecular markers will be necessary. And to avoid overdiagnosis and overtreatment and subsequent worsening of quality of life due to patient's anxiety, patient reported outcome studies will be mandatory. To conclude the presentation, I'd like to refer Professor Tato's review again. In order to apply this stratification decision-making framework properly, it's important to understand highly sensitive tools often detect small volume disease that may not require action. Key factors that pick up action requiring findings include tumor volume, size, tumor location, growth rate, symptoms, and patient preference. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Okay, so at this time, we're going to go back to our case um, we presented at the beginning of the presentation. So again, the 53-year-old woman that underwent thyroidectomy after being proven of thyroid cancer in, their, in her left thyroid lobe and found pathology that 2.1 centimeter with classical variant of PTC with six metastatic uh, lymph nodes was, were found. No extra thyroidal, thyroidal extension or lymphovascular invasion were reported. The patient underwent remnant ablation as well as TSH suppression therapy with levothyroxine. And on follow up, the patient was found with a TSH of 0.12, thyroid globulin of 0.41, undetectable thyroid globulin antibodies, and no clinically suspicious findings on the neck ultrasound. So, based on the uh, above described characteristics and what you heard in this presentation, we will invite you to um, answer to this poll. Great. Um, well, I would like to uh, thank you uh, both for outstanding presentations. Uh, based on our poll, it appears that uh, we have indeed had an impact on our viewers in terms of their response to how they judged um, that particular case here. So that's terrific. Um, I think one of the big questions from our audience has to do with um, how often are you getting um, uh, molecular testing and how much is that actually um, being used across um, the healthcare system and uh, with respect to making decisions in um, management? Maybe if, uh, Dr. Pichoya, um, could you just comment on that at the moment here? Well, we will do not use the molecular testing as we know, as you know, we are facing economical problems all the time in Latin America. So it is not easily implementable in, in Latin America. We can only use it when we have an advanced disease to define the treatment for those patients with and refractory, uh, with the rhyoiodine and refractory thyroid cancer, but not to define or to better predict the outcome, for example, having BRAF or uh, third for these patients, so we do not have a, any experience, and I don't think we are going to have uh, in the in the in the short time term. Okay, Dr. Sugitani, how often are you getting molecular testing in patients who are diagnosed with thyroid cancer? Mm. We also do not use uh, molecular tests uh, routinely, um, just for the. The clinical trial, as I mentioned, the TAT promoter mutation is a good uh, promise marker. So we'd like to uh, try this to uh, take into the consideration for in decision making to the lobectomy or so the thyroidectomy and uh, the follow up. Okay. Um, and one of our uh, viewers has asked if you could comment. Um, she presents a specific case of a 62-year-old man with a 5.5-centimeter uh, papillary thyroid cancer and uh, two negative lymph nodes were identified on pathology. The pathology um, identified lymphovascular invasion, um, and six weeks after surgery, thyroglobulin was 0 0.5 nanograms per ml um, with negative antibodies. Um, would um, she's asking whether or not you would recommend ablation for this uh, slightly larger but otherwise seemingly um, relatively low risk uh, papillary thyroid cancer? So we have to understand that probably this patient is having an initial intermediate risk of recurrence. We have to understand better understand also if the lymphovascular invasion is the same than the vascular invasion. Probably it is not the same. Vascular invasion uh, is well related to the a higher risk of recurrence. But as I explained before, when we have uh, these thyroglobulin levels in a patient with a well differentiated papillary thyroid cancer, 0.5 uh, during the first two or three months is indicating probably that this patient is going to do well. So I would. Uh, wait to decide remnant ablation in this patient 
and uh, not because of the initial risk of recurrence, but because of the response to treatment. And probably during follow-up, the trend of this thyroglobulin level will tell what to do with the remnant ablation. If thyroglobulin remains in this level or is less than one nanogram per ml, probably I will not uh, do remnant ablation for this patient. And Dr. Sugatani, would you comment on that? Would, we are, would you agree? Yeah, um, almost agree, but uh, in Japan, those patients uh, can be treated by orthectomy, actually. Yeah. So yeah. How, how, how large um, of a primary tumor? Uh, this was 5.5 centimeters. How large would you consider yeah, treating with a, lo but, with a uh, lobectomy? You know, um, size is the second uh, sec, uh, second importance, and I think the extra size of the invasion is clear that this case is uh, classified into a uh, high cases. But just uh, tumor size is not so important according to our uh, class, uh, list, class, list group classification. So, yeah, if oh. This, this patient preferred to a lobectomy, we can do and treat him by lobectomy. This is, this is so interesting because we have uh, the contrast here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the left, Dr. Sujitani with lobectomy, lobectomy as the first uh, approach for these patients. And here in Latin America, I would say that 90% or 98% of including low risk patients will be treated with total thyroidectomy. Even although we have evidence that these patients do very well with lobectomy, uh, here we have these data and we published last year that those patients with micropapillary thyroid cancer, 98% were uh, receiving uh, total thyroidectomy. And this patient had a risk of uh, adverse events of around one quarter, temporarily and permanent uh, adverse events with a prevalence of hypoparathyroidism of 5%, permanent hypoparathyroidism. So this is something very important we have to understand to move to this view of the oriental uh, mainly Japan view of lobectomy as a good treatment for those patients with low or intermediate risk thyroid cancers. Great. Could you talk a little bit about um, what, uh, how frequently you are follow, actually following up on patients um, who are established as excellent response to therapy? Um, how often do you have them undergo follow-up visits and testing? In Argentina, we usually tend to follow up every one year to these patients only uh, to see the replacement therapy more than the thyroglobulin level, although we usually ask, uh, we, uh, ask for uh, thyroglobulin antibodies and we do not ask for uh, ultrasound for those patients who had an initial uh, low or uh, intermediate risk of, re uh, of recurrence with an excellent response to treatment. Uh, probably we'll repeat the ultrasound if we have a negative one, probably we'll repeat it in five years, probably. But we need to understand that this changes in the last years and we cannot, it's very difficult to convince patients who were, for example, 10 years doing with an excellent response to treatment, doing an ultrasound and being uh, relaxed that they have a test that says that there's nothing in the neck and suddenly you say well novel protocols mean says that you do not need an ultrasound any longer so for those patients it's a bit more difficult to change the follow-up protocol even here uh, in Argentina that the patients are very demanded they ask for things they want things and we need to adapt and but for those patients who had the initial the diagnosis, now we can move to this uh, lower uh, use of ultrasound during the follow up and no very much frequent testing. And Dr. Sugatani, um, can you talk a little bit about the frequency of follow up um, uh, uh, based on, um, on, on those patients who obviously don't have structural um, mm -hmm. incomplete? 
for such patients, uh, we also examine the, the once a year, once a year, with the ultrasound and thyroglobulin and the antibody and the thyroid stimulating hormone measurement. Great, terrific. Um, well, I'd like to thank both of you. Unfortunately, we could uh, go on for quite some time on this fascinating topic. I want to thank both of you for outstanding presentations and for joining us from um, uh, such um, diverse parts of the world. Uh, we're unified um, in, our, uh, in, in the demands placed upon all of us in fighting this pandemic. And I wish everybody to stay safe and hope that you will all join us next week um, for another interesting and really educational um, presentation that I'm sure you'll enjoy. So thank you, everybody, and um, please stay safe. Thank you very much.